Today we're talking about one of my favorite topics, epiphany. You say, ooh, who doesn't love a good epiphany? I'm, I'm closing our summer series of awe with this final experience of awe, what inspires awe and wonder in, in us. And this idea of epiphany where some, something happens or some bit of information comes into our awareness that suddenly shifts our whole understanding in a way that we have a new perspective new perspective of ourself, a new perspective of God, a new perspective of our purpose. And in, a, in essence, I, I want to say too that I brought this series, uh, first of all, I thought it was kind of cool, the summer of awe, right? I thought if, if I've got to compete with the mountains of Colorado, I better have something in mind. And there's no doubt that the challenges of our time are heavy and that we can lose perspective that all around us is our opportunities to connect with wonder and awe, right? We talked about a variety of ways that we do that. And I brought it really as a means of inspiration, perhaps for myself and hopefully for you, to remember to do that, to remember to connect with that, to remember to be open to that. Even though life seems like this, there's always something happening that can draw us into to a greater perspective of ourselves and of our life. And not as a way to avoid the challenges of our time, right? To just bliss out in awe, but really as a way to be inspired and strengthened and connected in a way that we can actually stand up right and meet those challenges, actually in a way that we bring a greater perspective. We need a greater perspective, wouldn't you say? And so, just so you, I just wanted to give you, now that I'm at the end, I'm telling you why we're doing it. So there you have it. Um, so Epiphany is a well-suited finale for this journey of awe. Uh, the author, Dasher Keltner, whose book was inspired this series, defines, he says this about Epiphany. Awe, well, first of all, about awe, let me just remind you. Awe is about knowing, sensing, seeing, and understanding fundamental truths that leads to epiphanies across the wonders of life, transforming how we see the essential nature of the world. So really any experience of awe that connects us with something kind of greater than ourselves and puts us also in it, it's this opportunity, it's the paradox of being a part of something great and also knowing ourselves individually, that in and of itself is sort of an epiphany. There's more to me than this, and I'm part of this, and what is this, yes? So he did this interesting study across 26 cultures around the world, and he concluded this, that around the world, people were awestruck by philosophical insights, scientific discoveries, metaphysical ideas, personal realizations, mathematical equations, and sudden disclosures that transform life in an instant. In each instance, the epiphany unified facts, beliefs, values, intuitions and images into a new system of understanding. I think the great easy epiphany to think of that affected the whole world was Galileo's discovery that the world is actually not flat, right? Like, wait, what? Whew, everything, our whole perspective changes. And what I've really connected with through this experience is that our, the ways in which our world calls out to us to experience it in ways that we find awe and wonder in is sort of another way that the divine breaks through into us to connect with the fullness of life, that we can't, from our limited human perspective, we just can't always know. And in fact, as we've talked about 
so many times that there's that aspect of our limited human mind that really can just only navigate me, myself, and I, and that's its purpose. And so these experiences that make us go, oh, whoa, suddenly draw us out of that, even if it's like in that moment, right? Doesn't mean also that we don't act, right? We just, like I said, ah, oh, let God handle it. This divine plan is in charge. No, let it inspire us to have new ideas and new perspectives and bring that contribution to the world, however it is that we're individually called to do that. So, he talks about, and we've talked about, he talks about the, the, the ego self as the default self, right? That part of us that just really protects ourselves, watches for, for anything that could hurt us, and that also sort of has a pre pre prefers comfort and predictability, right? And there's really nothing about a divine intelligence and divine plan that really reeks of comfort and reliability. I mean, it's comforting, and it's, and it's changing, and it's evolving, and it's vast, and it's mysterious, and so at the same time that we, we sense the limits of our own mind to perceive that, and those limits of our mind can really be scary. There's part of us that says, ah, I need to know. If I don't know, anybody have that part? If I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. And there's another capacity, our spiritual capacity to no. And we have to, I have to, know what to do with the part that says, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know. So I liken this to um, the spiritual teaching that you've probably heard, and it's certainly in the, in the Christian tradition and in others as well, that we have to die to ourselves in order to live fully, which is like, well, that's not easy to do. How am I? And, and the Christian tradition has literally taken that to, it will be when you die that you actually experience the fullness of heaven, right? But from this perspective, we can see that this default self Again, we think that's who we are. We think that's the totality of who we are. And so what we're dying to is that limited view in order to know greater and greater fullness of ourselves and of life and of spirit itself that is living and moving through each one of us. Unity's co-founder Charles Fillmore said this of dying to the self, that it signifies our willingness to die to the little personal self so that we may be absorbed into divine mind, into the fullness of divine life and wisdom. But as so long as we think we've got to protect this little self, we can't quite do that. So we have to have faith. We have to trust that there is that divine plan and that we are part of it. And as we release and surrender some of those limitations, those ways of knowing which predominantly keep us, uh, result in a sense of separation, right? That somehow I'm, I'm, it's all me. And that, that can lead me to think I've got to compete with you or that you're trying to compete with me. And that doesn't feel very good and it doesn't usually end very well, right? The ways we act when we feel separate. I really think that is the key to so much of what we experience, the pain and destruction, when we feel on our own. And that is, of course, an, an illusion of our own mind we've created, particularly in our understanding that we are all expressions of one source of life. We are never separate from it, and because we share that, we are never really truly separate from each other. We're having individual experiences for sure. But we're all interconnected. And so 
what I think is brilliant about his conclusion here, he asks, you know, okay, we've studied all. We know that it expands. It's, as we said last week, awe is actually the foundation for our spiritual understanding. I mean, we have to grasp and have a sense that we're part of something greater to believe and to grow into a sense of spirit, yes? We can't, it's not tangible, but we know it. Gosh, I'm so tired. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've worn myself out already. Okay, hang on a minute. Um, so, what he asks this question what is it that awe connects us to? You would say, well, God, spirit, right? That's definitely part of it. I am part of something greater than myself is the simple answer. It all locates us in forces larger than ourself and allows us to perceive change before we shut down and panic about it, right? Because we're sensing, I think, a part of ourself. We sense that. So we, we're, we, we naturally gravitate to it and we can sense it without the fear that, and, and, and resistance that often change can, in, can instill in our, in our human experience. So he goes on to ask this intriguing question. What is it that awe connects us with that is larger than the self, that is initially invisible, but in the experience of awe and wonder becomes visible, that resists description and formulation, but appears like an image or a holistic pattern or an epiphany, allowing the default self-grip upon perception to be loosened and even dissolve a bit, where we perceive I am actually part of this whole life experience in ways I can't quite perceive? What is that? His finding was a simple but profound statement. It's a system. He says, awe enables us to see the systems underlying the wonders of life and locate ourselves in relation to them. We are part of all that is happening in life, and what we do affects all of life, and what others do affects us. Maybe not indirectly, but can you not agree that these, these past four years have really shown how interconnected we are? How, as something changes up here, we feel it. Dissolving the appearance of separation, which, as I've already said, is the root of so many of our difficulties. So Keltner concludes that awe's great epiphany is that it draws us to see how all of life operates within vast networks of systems. And he reminds us, too, that systems thinking is at the heart of indigenous science, now thousands of years old. It's an old, big idea that everything is connected. It may be our species' greatest epiphany to begin to actually live like that. So in the systems theory, we note how there is a constant process at work. That's the other thing about our default self. We don't really like to acknowledge that all of life is a process. Right? We think, okay, got it done. Here it is. I do this. We do that. You do that. Ah, good luck with that. And it's a process of becoming. It's a process of evolving. It's good that we don't stay the same. Oh, I've got a quote for you. Hang on, stick to your notes, because it, it'll make more sense if I do, I know. Our default mind gravitates to the certain and predictable, fixed, reliable essences of the world. And in truth, we know that there's really not all that much that is fixed and reliable for very long. And so these experiences of awe open us up to 
being present to the process, to the idea that we are changing, to the idea that life ebbs and flows, right? Just as the seasons show us every year. I will read the quote because I, um, just so you, you get a sense of what we're dealing with as humans. I heard this, I listened to it on Audible, and I laughed out loud and had to go back and make sure I heard it correctly. He says that our cycle of life compared to that of other primates is, defi- is a defining feature of our evolution. Because of the narrowing of the female pelvis brought about by our species shift in walking upright and the disproportionate size of the human head to accommodate our large language producing brain, our infants are born premature. In fact, wildly premature. Taking 10 to 52 years to reach semi-functioning independence. (laughs) So we're all doing all right. (laughs) If there is such a thing, he goes on to say. Our hyper-vulnerable babies require years of intensive face-to-face, skin-to-skin care, networks of caregivers, a safe home, and enculturation just to survive. I mean, that was kind of an epiphany for me because I just turned 53 this year and I feel like, I think I finally got it. (laughs) And so that's just a way of saying that the processes of life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the failing, the success, the successful experiences, the mundane experiences, all of that holds a potential for us to be growing and evolving. And I didn't think I would live through a time where that is so, so important. It's so, we've all got to do our part. We've all got to dig deep. We've all got to recognize what does it mean in my daily life that I am part of this huge system of life? How do I act? How do I behave? How do I treat the world, myself, others, knowing that, knowing the impact that I have? And this idea of epiphany, how can we then, through that idea that we are also connected, as our teaching says, our teaching of oneness, that we come from the one source of life, whatever you call it, and we are individual expressions of that. And so at a very simple level, we share the same divine parenting. We share the same source of life. And so how can we come up with systems? This is an interesting time when our systems seem to be failing. They're decaying. We've outgrown them. And that's part of the reality that, again, we want to build something and say, there it is, let it go. Thousands of years, and people are like, this isn't working. Because we're evolving. Dasher says that systems thinking emerged in our relation to nature and underlies traditional ecological knowledge. Our survival depended on our understanding of the social system, community, and again, indigenous people developed those systems thousands of years ago. So again, I don't think it's any coincidence that we are finally unraveling the effects of colonialism, that we have all suffered as a result of one particular part of humanity thinking it knows better than another and annihilating the wisdom of those already occupying this land and other land, right? That if one part of the human family is damaged like that, the whole system suffers. And that's what we're experiencing. So we can't go back, we can't change it, we can't fix it, but what can we learn? What can we rediscover and hold together to make the wholeness of the system work again? And I've long felt like our indigenous wisdom keepers know that. So I'll close with this. When certain 
Well, I already said that, I'm sorry. I'll finish it, let me say the whole statement. When certain members of the human family claim superiority and decimate other members, the whole family system suffers. That is what we are contending with today. We can't change or fix the past, but we can if we choose to be a part of the healing for the future and reclaim the fullness of humanity's family. Which, in the words of Charles Darwin, he, as he studied all the varieties in nature, he concluded so different from each other and dependent upon each other are these various and endless forms of life so beautiful. And so we've got to get past this idea that because we're different, that needs to be scary. Right? And because we're different and somewhat independent, that we don't affect each other. Because we really do. We've talked about the, our reaction to awe, like we get tears in our eyes from those moral acts of beauty, or we get chills when we hear amazing music or see beautiful art, or in the presence of new life, or even in the presence of life leaving through death. Those chills and tears, he says, so often accompanying our experiences of awe are themselves end results of systems behind our eyes and under our skin, signaling to our conscious minds the presence of vast forces that require we merge with others to adapt and to understand. And so I think as we are considering, so many have said we're kind of entering this time of a spiritual paradigm where we finally, you know, we've, we've maxed out our amazing intellectual capacity. We've mastered our physical well-being. We, we know how to stay alive. And now it's, it's, it's kind of the call of our time to really begin to connect with purpose and spiritual understanding that binds us And to live into that, to let that guide us, to let that support us, to let that inform us. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't consciously every day go, okay, how am I going to affect the whole world today? Or how am I going to affect the people that I interact with today? Sometimes I have to take a step back and say, I have the potential to do that, for better or worse or indifferent. And I'm in impacted by them as well. That's the other thing that I hope you've taken this time to recognize is how impacted we are by the systems, right? By our, by our culture, by our socialization, by our religion, by our education, all of that. We think we're so independent, but all of this stuff has been put into us or we have absorbed parts of us. Political, dare I mention. But do we really believe that? And is it life affirming? Is it true? Do I want to continue to express this and espouse this? Do I want to be part of something that connects us? So, you know, it, it takes a lot of self awareness and a lot of commitment, for sure. And the whole point of awe and wonder is that we are divinely supported in it, in every turn. We can be awe-inspired. We can be supported. We can have epiphanies where we see whole new perspectives that change our life and change the world. And so finding that unifying presence within and all around us, we find immediately that we are connected with something larger than ourselves. And that's a good thing. I don't know about you, but I'm real happy to know that. <laughs> so let's take a moment to just, I know I've thrown a lot at you there, to just consider for yourself this, this masterful idea, right, that we can actually have a huge change of perspective. You can consider for yourself quite easily 
that your understanding of life is not the same as it was when you were 21 or 15 or last year. That's a gift. That that is expanding. So just take a deep breath. Relax your physical body. Feel the chair beneath you. Floor supporting you. As you just go inward to contemplate a bit what I've tried to share with you about our capacity for epiphany to at any time be open to new experiences, to new understandings, to new information that can shift our whole outlook. So I would just ask you as you breathe into your heart space to consider for yourself, is there a new perspective calling you in any way, in any aspect of your life? Can you sense perhaps a belief or an understanding that you have in fact outgrown? And just beyond that, though it shifts how you see the world, perhaps, or how you understand yourself, it also expands it. Can you sense this greater purpose of this idea of epiphany, to expand you? To expand your awareness of what you are as an expression of divine intelligence, divine love, just as you are right here, right now. Is there a limiting perspective of yourself or of spirit itself that you can release? And as you do that, you may not have all the answers, but can you sense an opening, an expansion of energy, of possibility, of ideas? And I just invite you to remain open to that, to always be in consideration of the expansion of perception. That is your divine power and ability, ever evolving, ever growing. And no matter where you are on that exploration and that understanding. That expansion calls you and guides you. And so you can connect with this at any time. ready to grow in my understanding, in my perception. And for our ability to know this and to grow into this awareness, we just give thanks. Thank you, God. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you, divine mind and intelligence that meets me right where I am. I'm open and I'm willing. So we just open up our hearts and our minds in this time as we close with our meditative chant, pour yourself in me. 
creating an opening, a conscious opening for that awareness to grow in us. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast. If you found this program meaningful, consider making a donation at unitydenver.org. Just click on the green Donate Now button. We hope to see you in person sometime soon.